Welcome. I am so glad you're all here joining us for this really special webinar tonight. Uh, this is Partnering with Latino Audiences for the Eclipse and Beyond, and I'm going to do some introductions and we'll get started with our amazing panel lineup. Let me first just kind of tell you a little bit about why we're doing this. Um, the Astronomical Society of the Pacific uh, received a grant from the American Astronomical Society. It's a mini grant in honor of Juliana Steinheider Duncombe. She was this incredible astronomer and educator who started the US's first school lunch program to make sure that every child could come to school ready to learn and with a full belly. So she was a real social justice pioneer and this mini grant was in her honor. So we're thrilled to be one of the 31 institutions that received one of these grants and uh, the grant name is Astronomy Clubs Preparing Latino Audiences for the Eclipse. They're designed specifically to reach out to audiences that may not have um, been reached out to before. So uh, you can look, there's a link here if you just go to bit.ly slash Spanish Eclipse that has all the information about the program on it and links to the actual um, AAS site with even more information. Great. So um, what our mini grant did was to uh, partner with the NISE network of museums um, who generously offered their Spanish language eclipse materials to us. And this gave us the opportunity to supply banners and handouts and flyers and eclipse glasses, both in Spanish and in English, to clubs that volunteered to get the word out to their local Latino and Spanish speaking audiences about the eclipse. So here I've got the 22 Night Sky Network Astronomy Clubs who received the materials in Spanish and English. I imagine we have a lot of you on here today. If you wanna come and say hi and represent your club, feel free to put that in the chat window. So also anyone can access these materials online. They are freely available. You can print them yourselves um, at the same web URL. I listed it again here at the bottom. And this webinar, is a part of that grant and it serves to prepare clubs to do great outreach for the eclipse and beyond and it's going to be archived on the night sky network if you want to reach uh, that later or if you want to share it with other people who might not have made it tonight um, today's panel is not actually going to focus on specific eclipse activities but it's going to focus on clubs forming relationships with your local latino communities um, around astronomy outreach you can find links to any kind of specific activities in both Spanish and English on that URL. So if you want to look up the yardstick eclipse and have a Spanish um, description of that, we have that as well. So I think first I would like to do a quick poll to see what kind of experience the people who are on this call already have with doing specifically uh, reaching out to their Latino audiences in their um, local city. So Brian, could you start the first poll for me? Excellent. So go ahead. Oh, was there for a second. Go ahead. Okay, great. Um, go ahead and just put on there how often you do work specifically with Latino audiences. And I um, wanted to also give a shout out tonight. We have some of our astronomy ambassadors from the AAS um, and park rangers as well joining us tonight. So not just amateur astronomy clubs. We have a good mix of people. Hi to Mike, hi to Andy, great to see you there. Okay, we'll um, leave that poll open for just a second while I talk about why we're here at all. So um, it's really, oh, this is a quote here um, from Dr. Frida Kapoor Klein. She is one of the co-founders of the Level Playing Field Institute here in Oakland. And um, it's Hispanic and Latino representation in the STEM community that science, technology, engineering, and math in the workforce is really disproportionately low. You'll see from the um, uh, bars on the right-hand side to see what a low percentage that is currently. And astronomy, space, astronomy and um, space science in particular are at the bottom of the barrel when it comes to diversity in STEM fields. I was really, really bummed to see that when I was doing research and you know as well as I do, that's not because space science is more interesting to white or Asian people. This is, you know, space sparks our imagination of almost everyone you meet. So there are a whole lot of factors at play here. But one part of this issue that we can address as amateur astronomers and um, astronomy 
people doing astronomy outreach is access, right? So here is where we're going to be able to come and hopefully make a little bit of a difference. The amateur astronomy club members and other science communicators can, can come in here, excuse me. So let's take a look at the results from that poll. Brian, can you bring that up? Great. So yeah, some people have done this once or twice, uh, a few never, and a couple all the time or many times. So if you close that down, Brian, I think that will help with the slides progressing. OK, great. Thanks. All right. So excellent. So there, there are a lot of people here have had some outreach experience with Latino audiences. And we're going to talk a little bit about, well, actually, let's do one more poll. Let's see who's on the webinar today and how we identify ourselves. This is completely anonymous. Um, I should mention, too, that you can put questions in the Q&A section completely anonymously as well if you have questions you feel embarrassed to ask or um, just want to say without your name attached, feel free to put those in there. I want to talk a little bit about astronomy clubs. As, you know, in this country, there's a huge Hispanic population, but astronomy clubs as a whole don't have a lot of Latino members. So reaching out to your, directly to your local Latino audiences can provide opportunities to these communities that might not otherwise get a chance to maybe look through a telescope or touch a meteorite. Um, and it's gonna have broader effects as well. It's gonna breathe new life into our graying astronomy clubs, hopefully. Um, and larger than that, it's gonna eventually help change those numbers we were just looking at. Um, this, we're absolutely not the first people to address this issue. And this webinar isn't going to solve all of the larger issues in our society, but I really believe that this is an important conversation to have, and I am so excited to be having it with you today. Okay, let's see the poll results. Brian, if you would open that one up. All right. Yeah, so a lot of these results are similar to what we would find in an in a astronomy club in most places in the country. So I want to invite those of you who have experience in reaching out to Latino communities to chime in through the chat, and especially those of you who identify as Hispanic or Latino. We are eager to hear from you and hear about your experiences, because we recognize that the Latino community is really diverse, and it's going to have many voices and perspectives. So please feel free to chime in here. And now, what do you do when you have questions uh, about the best ways to reach out to a new group? Well, you ask the experts, and that's who we brought on here. So if you aren't already sharing your screen, I just want to encourage you to share your screen. These four generous panelists have stepped up to help guide us as we do this work together. First, I want to introduce Dr. Isabel Hawkins, who is one of my heroes. She has worked in astronomy and education research for more than 20 years. She has a passion for reaching underserved communities, specifically Latinos in STEM education. She does just an amazing job encouraging both the youth and elders of Latin American descent to bring the entirety of their cultural identity to bear in the learning of science, and I admire her greatly. Um, also here with us tonight is Dr. Brian Mendez. Uh, he's a professor of physics and astronomy. He also develops programs for the web and museums, among many, many hats he wears. You might know him from the Cosmic, Cosmic Serpent way back in 2012, I believe. Um, he strives to foster, foster diverse perspectives in his work with teachers, students, and the public. And he's also a sci-fi geek and a saxophonist. And he happens to have two of the cutest twins in all of the cosmos. So I, um, he happens to be a friend of mine, too. Thank you so much for joining us, Brian. I appreciate that. Uh, Alex Quinones works at the SAM Academy with many migrant parents and English language learners helping guide them to better understanding science. He was just telling me about how he worked with NASA programs and he got teachers and students involved in um, doing, bringing authentic science research into the classroom. He's also a huge Pittsburgh sports fan, I hear. <laughs> Congratulations, Alex, on the Stanley Cup. I am from Nashville, so we can't talk about that anymore. Um, but it's a really good thing you're an amateur astronomer because we'll have lots of other things to talk about. Um, really, congratulations, that was great. And Jose Sandoval, last but not least, his reach is absolutely enormous. Um, the Community Science Workshop Network, where he works, provides opportunities for youth uh, to tinker and make and explore their world through science in underserved communities across California. So I just want to thank you all so much.
for taking the time to join us and help us become more inclusive and effective in our outreach. Um, I have quite a few questions for you all, but I wanted to start quickly with a quote by Jose. Um, when we were emailing back and forth, he was speaking to the benefits of exposing students to science, and um, I wanted to just take this as a call to the amateur astronomers online here. Um, he said, just provide them the opportunity, the tools, and the experience, and they will be empowered and inspired as they take on an identity of a contributor, a producer, a scientist, and an astronomer. I just thought that was beautiful, so thanks, Jose. So I know the club members on this call are interested in reaching out to Latino audiences. I wanted to ask the panel this first question and then I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and you guys can just take it from there. So question being, for club members who are new to reaching out to their local Latino audiences, can you all suggest how they can get started and who and how and where? Uh, definitely it's reaching out your uh, your, your your community, you need to go out and uh, not be afraid to go and talk to uh, parents and, and, and students. And um, that's that's the problem with trying to go get Latino uh, people to come into astronomy or any of the sciences is that, you know, they don't want to do it. So if you go out there, you go knock on their door. I think that's one way we can get them involved. Very important. I, I like to add, um, this is Isabel. Um, for example, if you go to your local boys and girls clubs um, or any of the after school programs that might be serving um, your local schools, um, and if your local school is not serving a Latino audience, then figure out in your geography, you know, where the L Latinos live and that's where the kids are going to be going to school and then go to the after school programs and work with those coordinators or other community based organizations that would support Latino families, and I think that's a great way to reach out. Yeah, and to that I would add, um, community colleges can be a great uh, resource as well. Uh, so, you know, find the community college that maybe has a, a large population of Latinos there. Um, get to know the faculty, see if you can do some kind of presentation in one of the astronomy or physics classes and um, let the students get to know about your club and invite them to you know come to club meetings and, and become involved with the club i think you know one of the one of the most important strategies in trying to reach out to a community is trying to form a partnership with the community right it's not uh, it's a when you when you're trying to make these connections it's it's a human interaction and so you want to do the kind of thing whenever you would reach out to make a new friend. That's the kind of, that's, that's what you're doing, right? You're trying to make new friends. So <laughs> think in the, in the, along those, those, those lines. Yeah, yeah that's great. Um, I know I, from the logs of the Night Sky Network that, that there are a lot of clubs who are doing active outreach in churches too, and certainly in schools and um, community centers. So that's great. That's a really good, lot of good feedback there. I wanted to see if you all had um, experience with partnerships that you really felt worked super well and what made those partnerships between like a science professional or a science team and a, a Latino community, um, what made those successful? Why did they, why did they work so well? No, who's gonna go first? Round, round. I'll go first. Um, break the ice. The examples that I can think of, um, and I guess it actually just will pick up on on my last thoughts. The the, the most successful um, programs I have seen are ones where people spent a lot of time getting to know someone in the community that they were they were wanting to to work with and forming a relationship, getting to understand that community as well as they possibly could, and then creating programming with uh, that, the, those partners that they've made, right? So rather than having some notion of, I have this program that I wanna bring to you, it's what program can we together create that's going to um, 
that's going to be something that uh, the community will will appreciate and enjoy. And um, so I, the the programs that have done that, they take that time to build that relationship, and uh, and it takes time. It's it's not fast. You know, you can't expect it to just you show up at you know one after school program and next thing you know you're gonna you know be getting calls from all kinds of different uh, community organizations to have you show up with your telescopes. You know, you've got to you've got to take some time, get to know people, and um, and work on those relationships. Okay, I can I can say something. Um, in uh, 2011, I started a club uh, at uh, I used to go to college, Reedley College, and um, there was no science clubs. And I started a club called Space, which stands for uh, the Society of Physics, um, Astronomy, <clears throat> uh, Chemistry, and Engineering. And um, the goal was to get to do outreach for students there, and not just uh, STEM majors, but uh, students that were doing other majors that wanted to get involved with. You know anything science like like um, like astronomy, and um, it started out really small, but it it got really big, and um, it still exists. Uh, so it, it's something like that where you get other people from other types of uh, uh, majors to come in and do science and and do some astronomy. Uh, before I uh, you know graduated, uh, I was a uh, a business major, liking you know uh, science. And you don't have to be just a scientist to uh, to to love astronomy and you know to get other people to uh, to get involved. Um, and we had a lot of Latinos in in, in our club, and it was really popular. Um, and just the you know the the the, com the community that uh, that we had there uh, really went a long way, and uh, it's still going strong today. So today. I just want to chime in. I think that one of our strongest partnerships, and I think uh, Brian Mendes from UC Berkeley and also us at the Exploratorium have benefited from this partnership, has been with uh, Maya communities, local Maya communities who have either um, their own grassroots organizations for community outreach or they hold uh, ongoing uh, festivities that may have something to do, for example, with the equinox, which is very important to the Maya community because of Chichen Itza and kind of the descent of the feathered serpent on the pyramid and things like that. So tr kind of trying to find a cultural link um, from the astronomy or other types of science to the community is really important. And, and those links are usually very explicit if you start uh, talking with the grandparents because they're the ones that remember how to observe the stars and how their communities still use the stars and constellations and uh, the, the movement of the sun in the horizon to time uh, agricultural cycles that is still going on today. Um, so I think that uh, what I want to hearken to what all of our other panelists have said, which is developing that close relationship, um, de amistad, de confianza, de respeto, ¿no es cierto? So, so there's respect, there's, there's um, a friendship that, that uh, goes into issues of trust and sustainability, you know, how long you actually stay together with that community is really important. Um, and I think that, um, again, involving the elders in the community or, or the leaders, um, it's really a, a good way. And if you can identify a group that's already organized so that you can uh, be strategic and work together to do some co-development, and they themselves can then invite their communities to events that the community is already coming to, and then you add a layer of astronomy or science activities or space activities that have been co-developed with those community members. That's really powerful. Yeah, in fact, I see that uh, Andy Kretschy from, um, from Salinas uh, uh, chimed in with the same uh, notion of uh, they, did, uh, they did a very similar type of event. I think some yeah. members of our group showed up to one of their events before. Those are very, it's, it's, you know, that's a really smart thing to do. And, and the other thing is don't don't do don't think of just science or astronomy. You might you might think of steam, you know, adding arts 
or adding uh, performing arts or anything that gets the community together to begin with. And then you kind of tag on to that activity. That's always very, very powerful. And astronomy, of course, has everything to do with food, right? <laughs> How do you grow food has everything to do with the seasons and agricultural cycles. And so if you can tie in the astronomy and the relationship between the sun, moon, and the earth to food or to traditional home building or other kinds of activities that would resonate with a community, then that's a win-win. Oh, that's fabulous. Using all of your five senses to, to really incorporate astronomy into it. That's great. Uh, yeah, working with, um, uh, there are some resources I'll present at the end and some parts of, from Sci Girls and others who have done research on reaching out to Latino communities. And they really emphasize doing or, or having your events have access to the whole family because often the whole, an entire family from grandparents down to grandchildren will come. Um, so as opposed to just having an event just for children, make sure to include the whole um, family in that. I heard when I was reading up on it, that was one of the big um, recommendations. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I often say when people, you know, ask about, you know, how do I reach out to Latinos? You know, first I'll say, well, what Latinos? Because the Latino is an overly large um, label and, you know, you got to know your community a little bit better. But there are a few general things that are true. And one is that family, the family unit is, is supreme in, in Latino communities. And so if you're going to have a, an event, you should expect that a whole family will show. And that's one of the reasons why um, having um, some programming that's bilingual or having, you know, translators, someone who can be there is, is useful because, well, kids are often bilingual and they'll understand um, what, what's going on in English. You know, maybe the, the older generations may not so much and you want to engage them as much as you want to engage the kids. So it's really, it's really important to, to have um, someone who can, Okay, you know, if you, if you don't have anyone uh, in your group who speaks Spanish, you know, make the connection with, with someone in the community who can do the translation and, and you can work on that ahead of time with them so that you can do things in a bilingual way. So, and I'll say for me, for example, I'm, you know, I have uh, Mexican heritage, but I was raised in Michigan and I don't, <laughs> I don't speak, I don't speak Spanish very well. Um, so I always partner with someone who can speak it. And, uh, and we make sure that we do things in a, in a bilingual way. I find it also sometimes gives um, younger children and elders a chance to have their own areas of expertise where sometimes the younger children can do some of the translating and a lot of times the elders will have the stories like Isabel was talking about that there's, that they both see the relevance in each other's knowledge in a neat way around astronomy. I've seen that a couple of times as doing outreach. That's great. Um, I just want to encourage our uh, audience to feel free to add questions to the Q&A as we go. We've got a couple more before we open it up, but feel free to add any questions to the Q&A um, so we don't lose them in the chat window. Um, I, I wanted to take it in the other direction for just a minute and ask you if there are any stumbling blocks or common mistakes that people make when first reaching out to um, first connecting with a Latino community. Um, I know that there, you know, there's lots of room for mistakes and sometimes we make them and um, need to course correct. But I, I was wondering if there were some common ones that you see happening with, when people are good intentioned, but maybe aren't thinking things all the way through. Well, I, I can think of one that uh, actually I hadn't, when I was thinking of, of these questions beforehand, this one hadn't popped into my head until just now. So, hey, must mean it's good, right? <laughs> um, but one thing I have seen happen that I think is, you know, is something to be careful of uh, is if you're doing an event um, and you're highlighting some uh, cultural aspects, as, as Isabel was mentioning, which is a really powerful thing to do. Um, you should be careful that you are respectful of those of, of those cultural um, cultural knowledge pieces. One of the probably worst things I ever saw someone do, uh, and I won't name any names because actually I don't remember the name, so I can't. But you know, I saw a, a, a co-presentation 
by um, a Latina uh, storyteller. She was telling a story about um, uh, uh, the character, one of the one of the gods associated with the sun. She, she was telling this story about um, a Mexica legend about the sun, and she told that story, and then the amateur astronomer came up to then tell his his story. And what the what he started off by saying is, "Okay, now I'm here to tell you about the real sun." And, you know, I was just like, <laughs> what's not real about the story that was just told? You know, this idea that, that, that reality is only, you know, the, the scientific, scientific truth is the only form of reality that there is. You know, stories are an important way that we transmit cultural knowledge. And there's as much reality in a story as there is in an equation. And so I would say, you know, think about that. Think about, the, you know, what you're saying. Don't, don't put down someone's culture <laughs> when you're trying to reach out to them that's, that's the surest way to make sure they never show up again <laughs> well i'm making a connection back to the previous point that was made be sure to make uh, to build a relationship with the community before you simply walk in there with your telescope at nine o'clock at night thinking you're gonna have people show up to, to watch the stars. Um, but some of the communities that I've worked with, I, I, I spent two years in Watsonville and the relationship that was built with that community was built over 15 years. So if there was some sort of event that was coming up and we were the ones hosting it, they knew that um, it, it was the place to be. And then they trusted us and respected us and were willing to go along with anything that we would roll out. But I, at times I had seen some organizations coming from surrounding communities offering some sort of event or service and simply dropped in and it wasn't uh, accepted at all uh, for whatever reason it may be. But um, yes, uh, take the time to make a connection to the community. Whether it, uh, I think probably the best way would be um, finding organizations, of course, that are already doing the work. Um, like for example, reaching out to the CSWs, not just tooting our own horn, but uh, Find the people that are already doing the work and, um, and, and pass on that knowledge, pass on the tools uh, to them so they can then implement them uh, in their communities. Great. Thank you, guys. I, I find museums often will know who to connect with as well. If you can't think of anyone off the top of your head, a museum is sometimes a, a place to connect. Um, Thanks, you guys, so much. Um, I There are a few questions that came through, and Isabel, you were answering one so well about translation. And um, it, when you use a PowerPoint to use, for example, when you want to use a bilingual PowerPoint to, for example, use um, follow red for Spanish and purple for English, for example. But And then you mentioned that the fewer PowerPoints the better hands-on is the way to go. So did you want to talk about how you do bilingual events a little bit? You had answered it, some in there, but I'd be curious to hear what you had to say. You're asking me? Yeah, 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 yeah that'd be great. Uh, yeah, I, I think definitely, um, you know, the more that you can have Latinos outdoors <laughs> and, um, and everyone outdoors, right? I mean, what works for one human being will work for the other. And I think that when you're talking about astronomy, it's great to be able to go out and prepare people for looking at the sky and observing the sky. And I would say that probably one of the best times to talk about eclipse is right after sunset when the moon is on a um, waxing crescent, because you'll, you'll be, looking toward the uh, western horizon and the sun will just have set and hopefully you will see a tiny little crescent moon and the lit part of the moon will be pointing toward the will be you know illuminated by the light coming up from that horizon and so basically that gives you that teaching moment that talks about when you have a total solar eclipse that you have the new moon in front of the sun and um that you would have to have the moon and the sun aligned from your perspective here on earth to be able to see the eclipse. So I would say is that, yes, you know, give some basic information like that map that we saw to begin with, you know, a map with a path of totality or whatever. But I think even describing what is the path of totality, you know, it's really an oval or, or a circle about a hundred 
miles wide that is going to be traveling across the surface of the earth at you know going very very fast and i mean i think that given those images what's of what's happening to create that picture that you're showing in the in the powerpoint is very important so i would say you know the main thing is just to take your your families outdoors and have them look at the sky of course you also have to immediately talk about safety if you are in the path of totality so that you don't look at the sun at any time without protection without eclipse glasses or some kind of specialized filter especially during the partial phases um, but also that gives you the good opportunity to talk about how you project you know the image of of, of the eclipse uh, using things like your cross fingers or leaves from a tree <laughs> to pinhole cameras all sorts of different ways in which you can appreciate the partial faces of an eclipse and then you know that kind of takes you into that uh, experience of what people would see either through an online webcast if you're not in the path of totality or within that path but i think that you know beyond eclipse i think our greater goal is to get people looking up at the sky and appreciating the cosmos more broadly and to make the sky your friend so i think that if we can do that and boy when you you know you can just imagine in your mind's eye right when you're out looking at the western horizon and then the sky is beautifully red and then you have maybe venus and maybe the crescent moon there boy you can hook somebody just through that opportunity right there i hope that answers the way you describe things isabel it's fabulous thank you <laughs> yeah it absolutely did uh, and then some, thanks. Um, I just have a question here from Jose Aguilar. He says, I speak fluent Spanish, but don't have a fluent vocabulary for the technical terms in astronomy and physics, which I'm interested in. Other than, uh -oh. <laughs> other than uh, online dictionary translators, are there other methods for building a technical and science vocabulary in Spanish? I'd like to use Spanish terms that are actually used by a scientist. I run into the same problem all the time. Um, and, and I often have to ask, participants in my programs how do you say that word because I have no idea that was not in any of my learning um, do you guys know anywhere that's besides the translator that are there classes online where you can learn these terms or a, a great dictionary because often the astronomy terms are um, not organized in one place although sometimes they're the same which is nice <laughs> I think actually Wikipedia in Espanol is not too bad, <laughs> but uh, but you know, but but you kind of you know the more fleshed out the article is, usually that means that you know. But if it's like two words or whatever, oh, it's hard to trust. But what I did, I, I one time I had to go teach in Spain. That was a long time ago, but I had to go teach an astronomy course in Spain for like three weeks. And let me tell you, how do you say coronal mass ejection? And, you know, solar flare and things like that in Spanish, I had no clue. And so I actually bought some uh, technical books published in Spain or Latin America. You can just go and find those, those books online and just buy a technical astronomy book, a general but technical astronomy book written in Spanish and published by a, a Spanish or Latin American publishing company, and that gives you your terminology. The other thing is encyclopedias in Spanish that have a special book in astronomy, that those are also really good. Oh, sorry, I guess someone had muted me. <laughs> um, um, Usually I lean on Isabel or uh, <laughs> or another colleague, you know, who who uh, who had some training in, in Latin America um, in in the sciences. Because I mean, one of the th it's maybe not as big of an issue because you know most people who you're going to encounter will have not had an academic training in in Spanish in in those terms and so whether you use the word in Spanish or use it in English it's a new word right it's just a new vocabulary word in either language that they're going to learn so it's maybe not as big of a deal when it comes to the technical terminology 
Yeah, good point. A couple of people just said, I have an idea. Let's get the ASP to publish a bilingual glossary <laughs> for all those tough terms, and we would have to update it every six months. Um, <laughs> wow, that's yeah. actually, it, it, it would grow. That. It would It'd be a pretty cool resource, yeah. Yeah, it would. We just have it online. That would. That's a great idea. Okay, cool. Maybe if that comes out of this, I'd be thrilled. Thanks, Andy and Teresa. Um, does anybody else have any other questions, or if you guys panelists have anything you want to share with the amateur astronomy community, I'm we're all ears and really excited to learn from you. Yeah, great, you guys. Otherwise, I want to. Um, Share a couple more resources with everybody. Let's see if that works. All right, yeah, so at that same site that I was showing you earlier, um, uh, there are some more resources, including videos and um, pamphlets and handouts in Spanish and English. and. Um, some really great engagement strategies from Sci Girls and PBS. They're just like one page handouts for engaging diverse audiences. Um, and this double AS resources on diversity is a link on that page as well. And I tell you what, I, I was blown away by everything that they included on that. It's a really incredible um, resource if you want to kind of take this discussion further and work on unconscious bias and understanding privilege and what to do when you make a mistake, uh, things like that, that you will encounter the more work you do. Um, so I encourage you to take a look at all of those resources on there. Um, I really, really want to thank you panelists for sharing your time and your knowledge with us. I can't thank you enough um, for being here with us today. And I really hope that this is just the beginning of uh, many more conversations that the amateur astronomy community will have around equity and inclusion. I know that here at the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, we're really dedicated to better serving diverse audiences. And we've um, been working, for example, with Girl Scouts on how amateur astronomy clubs can better serve girls. And um, so I know we're gonna be talking about this and I, I really hope that this is just the beginning of your conversation as well. You can reach out to me anytime. Feel free to um, email me or um, find us through the Night Sky Network. And, um, oh, I, there's a message here that says the NISE network is producing a series of earth and space activity toolkits um, over the next several years and all of their materials they make in English and Spanish. That's where we got quite a few of these materials for the grant um, and I can't recommend those enough as well. Um, so thank you for that. Um, and let's see, how do you, oh, there is a question, one more question here for you guys before we go. How do you address misconceptions people have without being exclusionary? Um, that's kind of a general question that I think um, is a is a tough one, no matter who you're sharing this with. But do you guys have any suggestions for that? I'm going to stop sharing the screen. Um, I think acknowledge, probably acknowledge that everybody has those misconceptions. You know, I mean, most people will have these misconceptions because we are here on on the earth and we observe the sky. So we have a very much a geocentric perspective. And I think that's another thing that as professional astronomers come on very, very hard, uh, kind of telling you that you're wrong and it's the heliocentric perspective that we can only you know, acknowledge as correct. On the other hand, we're all here observing, <laughs> using terminology of sunrise, sunset, I mean, even all of our language. So I think acknowledging the fact that we live in a geocentric environment and experience and that we also know that there is a heliocentric uh, explanation but not completely negating or invalidating the actual real experience that you're having yourself as you're explaining an eclipse or a sunrise or a sunset. Yeah I agree and I would also add that um, I guess you should clarify whether it's a misconception or a different conception. Because, you know, if it's just a different conception, then maybe just leave that alone. But, if, you know, if it's something about, 
you know, when the seasons occur or how the, how the phases of the moon are connected to, to the location of the sun or the season or something like that, then, you know, I think it, it's, for me, the, the way to always try to correct a misconception is to provide people with some evidence, right? To actually have them look at something and see, you know, people don't realize that the moon is visible in the daytime sky, like every day, except for one or maybe two, <laughs> right? And, you know, the easiest way to combat that one is, you know, point at it, hey, there it is in the daytime sky, voila. So I just, you know, providing people with, with evidence, you know, and if, if you can't do that because, you know, the object or whatever is not up or it's a long-term thing, pointing to people to resources or doing some hands-on activities that help them, you know, understand things. So doing hands-on activities about the seasons or the phases of the moon, you know, you should be doing that anyway at your events, right? So <laughs> those are those are great, you know, important ways to, to help people um, understand some of these concepts, which are, really you know they require a fair bit of you know three-dimensional abstraction which is kind of unnatural <laughs> for, for most people so you gotta let people you know grapple with those, those things um vivian is there time for me to add a little one more or are we please done? tell me everything okay um i was just just like this conversation got me i don't know uh motivated but um i would say that also like when you talk to elders uh, especially from rural communities um in latin america they will say oh you know uh we uh, our community my parents would, would ask us to go out and bang pots and pans during an eclipse you know just because you know we wanted the moon to go away and, and let the sun come back to us you know so there's this kind of um, tension between a tradition or perhaps, I don't know if it would be called a misconception or maybe a myth or, or a belief, um, but even like using the word myth, you know, makes it look as if it's like unscientific, right? Um, there are other communities in which the parents would be um, concerned about the children looking at, at the eclipse at all, and so they would go indoors and not allow them to look at the eclipse. And some of these um, customs or traditions, I think that we shouldn't uh, place our own values on them and say, oh, how silly, you know, that you don't let, you know, people come out and, and look at the eclipse even with appropriate protection of your eyes. Uh, because sometimes these traditions come from a very, very long time, and maybe the depths of the tradition is, is not understood by us, and at times, maybe some people don't even want us to understand. It's not for us to understand. So I think that being very respectful of anything that we might at first value call like a myth or a misconception, just, and I think that that's when you develop that relationship um, with people like Jose and Alex were talking about, and Brian, when you develop that relationship, you can, you can start to understand where does that come from, you know? And a lot of times I think, especially when, when people have had longstanding relationships with a particular place, like have lived in the same area for many, many generations, then their knowledge is deep seated in that place. And when they come and tell you about one of their traditions, a lot of times that kind of always lights a light bulb in my mind that that tradition probably has some kind of a scientific basis. Uh, because it's kept that community alive for so many generations. So there's probably a very sustainable track of science in there, somewhere embedded in there. And it's all conflated with belief systems and storytelling and, you know, different perceptions of what's real or what's, what is observable or, or what is correct uh, for your community. So these are very complex things. So I would say you know, be careful and develop the relationship, ask many questions and go in and with a position of humility and, and uh, also invite some of the elders to be co-presenters with you. Oh my goodness, if you do that, you know, by developing an activity together and then you invite the elder to co-present. So in the, at the same time that you're, you know, that you're doing your, your demonstration or what have you, then you ask these uh, community members, and maybe it's not an elder, maybe someone else, a teacher or someone who has their own knowledge, and you put them in a position of authority. That's 
incredibly validating and important. Yeah, that's a really excellent point. Um, I remember doing outreach down in San Jose at the Lunada and often they, I would, I heard many times over and over, well, back in Mexico, we could see the stars and, and, and then it would begin a discussion of, of their, of the sky stories that they would tell from when they lived in a place that had much less light pollution than San Jose, for example. Yeah, no, these are, these are really important stories. Um, I wanted along those same lines to mention um, on that webpage, we also have uh, another resource put out by the Lunar Planetary Institute that's called The Vanishing Sun, and it's eclipse tales from around the world that are told by people from those um, audiences. So I, I just want to thank you all so much uh, for being here tonight and really excellent information. So we'll have this webinar archived and you can access it at any time. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, let's see, there were, oh, there's another question that came in at the last minute. <laughs> Lots of, um, uh, yeah, so these were just some more suggestions and we'll include those um, it, places to reach out to uh, Latino audiences by finding out what your club's demographics are and including spouses and children's, children, <laughs> um, boys and girls clubs, YAMCA and YWCA. Um, so thank you. Thank you to all of the panelists. Thanks to everyone who's listening in. I appreciate all of you and it's been an honor to talk with you tonight. Thank you. Thank you.